are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Hello, hello, Sense of Beer Style listeners and viewers, and Jeremy. Hello, how's it going? It's going great on this Friday of unnamed dates because the shows live into perpetuity covering the 2021 Beer Judge Certification Program Guidelines, but it's Friday, so I'm excited about that. And it should be Friday anywhere in our minds all the time, and also happy hour, um, and also beer study time. And Jeremy's already going for it. Oh, my goodness. Um, And we are getting ready to kick off in less than a half hour. Uh, Amber and Brown American beer. And we obviously lead with American Amber Ale. And I can't be more excited to kick it off. So how we always do the show is we kind of give you a big picture on the, the beer style's relevance, what it's really about in a nutshell, and then we dive into ingredients and appearance, aroma, flavor, mouthfeel, and much, much more. But that's all in the style guidelines too. We're here to reinforce and help you get aligned in a very conversational fashion. And with that, speaking of conversation, nothing gets conversation going better than opening a beer. Yes, so, I jumped the gun and, and I paid the price for it as uh, as my foam kind of popped out of the glass. And and uh, it, it, that's an interesting thing. If if you have a, a foamy beer uh, out of a bottle or a can and, and and it shouldn't be foamy, it wasn't shaken or dropped or anything like that. That does uh, lead a little bit of suspect that maybe there could possibly be an infection in there, uh, but not always. So, um, so I will taste my beer uh, thoroughly to make sure that it's not uh, 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 bubbled up when I open it. If, if you're not watching this, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we will see if that uh, holds true or not. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna also give you a hard time because it, Cicerone style level of what Jeremy has accomplished, advanced, no small task. Uh, me included, because I know, because I, I yeah. that's how hard it is to test, take the test. I finally passed it. Uh, Jeremy was confronted with this foam and didn't do what you would do table side, which is use his uh, skills and uh, his palate to um, absorb the foam. Um, you would, if you opened one of those and you were serving at table side, obviously have a towel next to you already because that's proper beer service yes. and have that handled that way. But that was kind of funny. So let's talk big picture. This is an American, um, absolutely uh, created, uh, born and bred style. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. But before I do that, it's it's amber, right? Or red. That's yeah. the color you're seeing in the glass and known to be hoppy, certainly more hoppy than um, certain other styles that inspired it. Uh, and medium strength, definitely very sessionable. Some caramel notes. Um, and yet, to me, it's one of my favorite, favorite styles. Uh, and we'll also get into comparative styles. But it gives you malt. It gives you hops. It gives you sessionability, in my view. Uh, it's not too light or too heavy. They're beautiful. For sure. Yeah. And I think the history brings us to uh, uh, Mendocino Brewing Company, which was out of California and one of the uh, first brew pubs in the country, really. Uh, And I I personally had bought stock in Mendocino when they were um, available, believe it or not, a craft brewer with or a brewer in those days with stock options. Uh, But I will say that stock went in the shitter and it was not a good play. Uh, my brother, dad, and I were uh, were washing our hands with a couple hundred bucks that we threw towards it, even though we wanted to support um, the beer. The brewery Mendocino just never made it, but they did create Red Tail Ale, which was inspired by American Pale Ale of the California era and just made it more malty um, and a little more hoppy. And, and I, from the start, was sold. Like, this style just got me, got me good, right? And so, Jeremy, why don't you start to take us into sensory so we can finally drink our beer and um, talk about ingredients? Yeah, so uh, with the ingredients, this is this this is one of the first beers I fell in love with in in the beginning of my craft beer world. It, it's so approachable, it's so easy. It's it's not too much for someone adverse to bitterness, but the balance is there. Typically, what we can expect to find in a in a, a ingredient list on a beer like this is you know the a BJCP uh, the the newest guidelines of twenty twenty one call it a neutral pale ale malt. 
um, we, those of us who brew, we would say we want an American two row malt, uh, just has a nice base malt. Um, uh, but you can get some or start adding some medium to dark crystal malts. Uh, you can you, uh, play around with some other malts that are going to add a little bit of uh, sweetness, a little bit of character, a little bit of color. Uh, uh, with this, uh, because it's American, we are going to start uh, looking for American or uh, quote unquote new world hops. New world hops really refers to uh, Australia, New Zealand, even South Africa, uh, South Africa, but uh, especially some of the hops that are coming out of the U.S. are now considered new world uh, as well with all the tropical flavors. So all of that is fair game. Uh, there, there are no strict rules on this stuff. Uh, when it comes to yeast, uh, we're looking for kind of a neutral uh, to a light estuary American ale yeast. Uh, it's, you know, it should be kind of clean, but a little bit of those fruity estuary notes is just absolutely lovely. Uh, so that's the ingredient list that I expect to see. Uh, let's start talking. We've got our glasses out. Let's talk about the appearance that we alluded to a minute ago. Love it. And appearance, as I was showing you in the screen, if you do watch and, and if you're listening, don't feel like you're missing out. A, you could get your own oh. beer, put it in your own glass and look at it and taste it. <laughs> or uh, B, or as my in. friend Julia says, brew it yourself. Yes, or homebrew one. Absolutely. Or tune in in the future. We also produce these on uh, YouTube. So appearance is pretty straightforward. There, the, the, the wording is um, a deep amber. Um, on and then to copper, copper, uh, you know, light brown. I mean, I would I would hesitate to even put brown in there, but it says coppery brown in the style guidelines. Um, and you get these reddish hues sometimes, um, which are beautiful. Frankly, it's a beautifully colored beer. It's really inviting. Doesn't look like a kind of a a more um, less nuanced and flavorful lager, right? It looks like an ale, which is kind of fun with those uh, those more pale malt notes and some caramel uh, malt and, and the like. Um, a large off white collar of foam. Mine's collapsed. Um, it's not purely yeah. white, and and that's that's standard with good uh, head retention, and and it generally should be quite clear. You know, you've got a lot more hopping going on, and the uh, craft brewers heavy hands these days, so hops can give you a hop haze or some something, but it should generally be clear. I like how the style guidelines don't insist that it needs to be brilliant. Um, I think that allows for some good allowances. Also, when it's uh, not brilliant, it means it's probably less filtered and, and might have a little more body to it and a little more flavor because of that. So yeah, there's absolutely. your appearance. And what about aroma? So for aroma, when we think about a balanced beer where the the malt and the hops really share the stage on your palate, this one should be very well balanced, but it should have a very decided lean toward the malt. That's that's kind of the the beauty of these amber ales, um, especially back in the day. The, these are beers that are harder to find. Uh, they have not uh, completely, totally commercially extinct, but it, our palate has gone toward the bitterness, which uh, I love, but I think it's a shame that we don't retain these in the market as much as they used to uh, used to have because. These have just this beautiful, um, a wide range of multi flavors. Uh, again, it, you know the balance is there, but the it could be a medium low, could be medium high. But this multi flavor just has so much character. Could have uh, caramel, could have these uh, esters of fruits of of palm fruits like apple, not the bad kind of apple that that's an off flavor, but like the good kind of apple. It could even get into like I, I've tasted uh, ambers with like graham cracker or pie crust, and those are just absolutely beautiful. When we're talking about the hops, uh, we're looking at kind of a, like a, a low to medium hop flavor. Could you know we mentioned the the um, could be uh, American hops or New World hops. So we're talking pine resin. Could be spicy, woody, tropical fruit. Uh, it could be citrus. Could be berries. Uh, it could be stone fruit. And all of this stuff is just wonderful. Uh, again, uh, when we talked about the the fermentation uh, profile. Uh, uh, this is all what we're smelling in the aroma, but when, when we get to the fermentation part, we should be fairly clean. Uh, if we've, if we've got esters, great. That's coming from uh, the fermentation, but it should be fairly clean without any uh, aromas that suggest anything kind of funky in there. Uh, but how does that translate into flavor or the taste? Great baton pass. Thank you. And esters, which you kind of lingered on because this is an ale, as Jeremy's yeah. saying. Um, fruity esters in the flavor actually can be moderate to none. Esters are much more so always going to display actually in the aroma. But you can get hints yeah. of them or, or more prominence in the in the flavor. 
Um, you know, that moderate to high hop flavor is going to be apparent. Um, it's not just about the bittering or aroma hops in these beers. And, uh, you know, malt is, is one of the, uh, the front stars, right? The hops are kind of right behind it, but malt flavors are moderate to strong. That's a big word, strong. It means you really should be getting the essence of pale malts and those added malts. Um, and some, uh, you know, residual sugar, some malty sweetness, um, and then the essence of caramel, I really like that. Um, I always say when I sat for Master Cicerone, I had to, first time I sat, I was just like, how many different ways can I say the word caramel in flavor, right? <laughs> and so caramel is definitely on a spectrum. So when I say caramel, my my rich caramel um, you know, candy might be going towards your toffee. I'm not saying that these styles go towards toffee. I'm saying they go to caramel candy, the kind you get in the hardware store or the old school candy store, um, but not in a uh, cloying or aggressive way. Uh, you can get toasty or biscuity. That's very common. Um, and then darker roasted malt flavors should be absent. You should not be getting that essence of anything that takes you towards a brown ale uh, or above. That's really important. Uh, moderate to high bitterness is the point. California is the state that taught us about aggressive hopping um, and this being inspired by American pale ales to kind of up the ante uh, really did take these uh, these paler um, ales to a, to a hoppier, uh, more bitter place. And yet you want it to mostly be balanced between the malt and the hops, although I'm still going to ode to the hot, to the malt to say that's what should really carry the day as I, as I smell it and get ready to taste it. So that's what I got on flavor. Um, what about uh, mouthfeel? Mouthfeel, you know, we're talking about uh, malt, we're talking about caramel. So we're talking about residual sugars in this beer as well. Uh, so therefore that's going to translate to, it could be a medium to medium full body, uh, according to the guidelines. I have yet to taste an American Amber with a full body. I mean, not, not something chewy, but, but that you can get this texture, this viscosity, just because of all those residual sugars when it's, uh, you know, be- because it's an amber and because it's malt forward. And mm-hmm. if it's not fully attenuated, then we're going to have this wonderful uh, mouthfeel. Uh, but you can have this medium to higher carbonation. It's a wonderful thing to have this mouthfeel and then have like a little bit higher carbonation to kind of cleanse your palate after that. That is a wonderful sensation. It's something I urge all of you watching or listening to really uh, pay attention to and evaluate. What is the viscosity of the beer? What does the carbonation do to the beer? Those are two very different things. Then the finish, yet an even third thing is how it finishes. I, I think about flavors like a boat going by, uh, you know, and, and, and then when we talk about finish, that would be the wake that the boat has left. Right. And, and so that, it, that's just, you know, what, what are you, what's lingering on your palate? What flavor, what texture, what, what, uh, how does it feel really is, is, has, that's how I think of finish. But astringency, uh, astringency, it shouldn't be there. This is the astringency, particularly comes from uh, uh, hops, and 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 this should be the hop should be balanced. It should be kind of faded back a little bit. So I don't expect astringency. If you get a little bit, a little bit of alcohol warmth, uh, I, I in my experience, it's not typical, but that is absolutely allowed to have just a little bit of that if you have a stronger version of this stuff. So, so. Uh, so taste your beer, smell your beer, but also pay attention to how it feels on your palate. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful senses that you that you can enjoy. Uh, so th- that's my dissertation on uh, on mouthfeel. Let's talk about uh, how these styles or how this style compares to other ones that are similar to it. Awesome. And I love the style comparison of the style guidelines, not just for beer studies, but also for the fact that I could hold this glass up and am. And you might not be able to tell which style it is. It could be yeah. an American pale ale looking at that. It could be a red IPA, right? It could be an American strong ale. That's what's hard about the studies, but that's why you do it. And the reward is you get to taste and taste again. Uh, yeah. So this is darker, more caramel, and more umph for body um, and uh, you know, than American pale ales. But the residual bitterness is less. It's more about the flavor and the aroma, right? That aggressive hopping, when I say it from California that created this style, that doesn't mean they aggressively, more aggressively um, bitter hopped it, right? But the flavor and the aroma um, 
is uh, there and it's less bitter um, than American pale ales. That's that's the truth. A um, little less alcohol and bitterness and hop character than red IPAs. I will also note, though, I think the style guidelines come up short on this because red IPAs have that bite of, of sometimes rye in there that gives that red color, those red hues. So that doesn't really um, take me to a place that's fully understanding in that. But it's fair if you were going to do a blind tasting and try to calibrate on the style to slip a red IPA in and test it out. Um, and then less strength malt and hop character than American strong ales. That's just very straightforward. And American strong ales are great, um, big spectrum. If you've listened to our style cast on that, but a great one to test against this because you'll really dial into the hop flavor and aroma from an American amber ale when you taste it against an American strong ale. And then last but not least, I already mentioned the style, the American brown, but it's less chocolate and dark caramel than an American brown ale, which is definitely an overlooked style. One I love to see on, you know, brew pub and restaurant menus because it's such a great pairing style. Uh, but this is simply just less chocolate and less caramel than that American style. Yeah. And frankly, I, I'm a little surprised that this isn't in that style comparison for the guidelines, but I think this would be for anyone who needs to study the style and learn the style, I think it would be a great side-by-side uh, -side, uh, thing to put it with a, a British pale. Uh, Absolutely. Be, uh, which because, you know, it, British versus American, uh, American tends to hop more than British. Uh, so there's a little bit more bitterness there. So so taking an American amber and a British pale ale, putting them side by side ought to be just like neck and neck with character and profile, but with a different set of ingredients. So what an education you could get by drinking those two beers side by side. Yeah, um, th that would be my my advice. But as far as commercial examples to go find an amber. Um, uh, I should have saved that comment I made earlier for this, but uh, unfortunately, much to my lament, uh, American Ambers are harder to find these days. American Ambers, American Reds, they're harder to find these days than they used to be when I first started really enjoying these beers. Um, and, and that's just because our palate has gone toward uh, hoppiness and, and bitterness and hop flavor, and it's all about the hops. Uh, but they still exist. Uh, some of the, the beers you can find uh, would be the uh, Anderson Valley Boont Amber Ale. Uh, Bell's, uh, Bell's uh, Brewery in, in um, Michigan still puts out their uh, Bell's Amber. I've, I've been able to find that pretty easily. Uh, North Coast Red Seal Ale is a classic. I love that beer. Uh, St. Arnold Amber Ale and Trogues uh, Hotback Amber Ale. Um, <clears throat> That being said, those are the, the classic ones listed on the guidelines, but there are still a lot of, of uh, craft breweries that still play around with Ambers because we love them so much. Here's a, a couple from Washington from 5440. What a great name. Red Zeppelin. What a perfect name for a, a red, you know, right? And then, of course, then uh, No Lie uh, 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 Porch Glow. I mean, these are, these are beers that uh, iconic uh, craft brewers are still playing with the style. It's just you might have to look a little bit harder to find them. So hopefully that will help you um, head that direction. Uh, let's talk about some of the numbers and the vital stats for this beer. Yes, and I'm I'm calibrating on the numbers before I prep them for you, uh, or as I prep them for you, on drinking my Ska um, Pinstripe Red Ale, which has been mm -hmm. around forever, and they're a regional great brewery out of Cal Colorado, 5.2% alcohol, and I would definitely put it on the list as a great example of an American Amber, although they call it a Red Ale, and, and yeah. Jeremy will point out that's obviously they go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, so no on this, yeah, absolutely. On the statistics, uh, final gravity is 1010 to 1015. That's going to take us to a sweeter place, right? Not re high residual sugar, but you've definitely got some um, under 1010 or 1008, things get drier. Um, so I think that's really important. I also did look up on the Brewers Association World Beer Style Guidelines, um, which are not totally in sync with the same exact stats as BJCP. So I am going to cite Final Gravity Plato, but the Plato for BA guidelines is 2.5 to 4.6 for, for Final Gravity. So keeping that in mind, um, that's going to take us to an alcohol by volume level of 4.5 to 6.2%. Again, to me, that's a very sessionable level. You start to get above 6, 5, 7%. You're getting into more IPA range and, and just a little more girth. And it's harder for me to drink, say, three beers in a night compared to two because it's just getting a little more um, bumped to that alcohol. You've also got alcohol by weight for the BA guidelines, 3.5 to 4.8. So there you go for those uh, paying attention to the uh, the kind of European metrics. Um, and then international bitterness units, because hops and bitterness are such an essential part of this style, is a broad range, 25 to 40. 
there's a big difference there. 25 is definitely discernible, but it's not really carrying the day. You start to get up to 40 IBUs, international bitterness units, and you're really talking about some umph there um, for the hops, although the residual sugar, the higher it is, will balance that. And that's that BU to GU ratio that we talk about often. And then standard reference method or the color that the BJCP style guidelines talk about is a range of 10 to 17. Um, we did a style cast, Jeremy, a few weeks ago. You corrected me. I was, I was talking about amber in an improper place, too light on the SRM scale. Um, and so this, you know, this amber to copper, like copper brownish, that 10 to 17 range or 10 to 20, just think of like, it's a step ladder of amber to copper to light brown in that 10 to 20 SRM range. And this covers almost that entire spectrum. Yeah. And then also too on, um, the uh, the the color ranges um, kind of for the European brewing convention side of it, it's 16 to 36. Maybe you can just start talk, talking in your head that you've got two sixes there and it's almost doubling 16 to get you to 36. That might be helpful in memory. Uh, and last but not least, I think I covered it all. I never talked about original gravity. T Final gravity is much more relevant to me, but original gravity, if you're actually yeah. home brewing or brewing is helpful. 1045 to 1060, that's going to tell you a beer range. It's very common in um, American pale ales too, and, and not, not too much of that body or weight or potential alcohol. Yeah. And, uh, and all that makes sense. And especially when it comes to copper, I mean, amber and copper and red is, that's why we put ambers and reds together in the same category, because, uh, you know, the, the flavor is very, very similar and the color is so close that you kind of really have to, uh, uh, dissect it down to, uh, to a very tight, uh, spec. But, uh, if, if I, if I were forced to give a number for a copper color, I I'd say it's a SRM of 15. And yeah. so what you mentioned is we're going through amber through copper and we're heading toward brown, but, but we're still talking about the same type of thing. Uh, talking about a uh, glass type, uh, you know, typically, uh, this is my least favorite. No, I can't say my least favorite. It's one of my least favorite glasses to drink a beer out of. Uh, really. It doesn't matter. I just need, I just need that liquid to get to my lips and, and all as well. Uh, but when I want to get fancy and stick my pinky out, uh, the uh, a classic American shaker pint is not the glass that I prefer to drink out of just because it it's very functional for the the establishment, for the uh, account, but it's not that functional for the beer. It doesn't it doesn't dress up your beer like it could. But that said, this is what we're most likely to find these beers out of, especially uh, in the past uh, 20, 40 years. These days there are, uh, uh, pubs and breweries that are starting to bring some fancier glassware and I, and I love it. Um, but bottom line is just drink the beer and enjoy it. I will beg you, uh, when we're going to talk about, uh, uh, temperature now that these beers, they're going to be in a cooler or in your refrigerator at 38 degrees, 30 to 40, 38 to 40 degrees, or about four to five uh, degrees Celsius that's too cold for this beer. Um, grab this beer, hold it in your hand, let it warm up, let it, uh, let these flavors finally release, get to your nose, get to your palate. And, and I will beg you, I will beg you on my hands and knees, please do not drink this beer out of a frosted frozen glass. That will just ruin the experience. Uh, ask your server. And I do this all the time, please. Can I have a, a glass that uh, is not out of the freezer. And, and I actually will ask for that. I'll even ask for this, these beers to be served in a wine glass on occasion uh, when, when they're served to me in like a mason jar or something. I, I will ask for a better glass. So so take uh, take your glasses seriously. Take your temperatures seriously because it's, it's your experience. It's your money. Um, uh, but more importantly, let's talk about what we'd pair with this. Pairing, pairing, here we go. And the strong yeah. finish, we like to add this, even though the style guidelines don't cover this anywhere. So you're getting added value here with Sense of Beer Style and your hosts. Mm -hmm. yes, um, th th this is a beer, when you start to uh, talk about caramel flavors, right? Maybe a little biscuity, um, those pale malt notes and the like, you obviously go to barbecue. I mean, barbecue and also doesn't have to be out of respect for our, our vegetarian and, and other friends. Um, this could be something as a preparation, right? That sauce. Think, think, and my mouth is starting to water, you know, think, think sweet, sweet, yet um, a little bit of sour with some vinegar in it type of barbecue sauce, you know, drizzled on anything from vegetables that have been char grilled where you see those sear marks, right? And you've got to get those links and, and hooks to 
the preparation, the um, the heat influence from the barbecue, and then also the proteins that are taking to that sauce that then will find their way to the pale malts, the caramel flavors in your in your amber ale. So I'm going with barbecue. Um, I always go to crackbeer.com, which uh, me and, and my many of my colleagues have contributed to over the years. And, and the dessert I love, uh, it's not one for me. It's probably from Andy Sparhawk, who I worked with for many years. Vanilla, banana pound cake. I just love that. Oh, that, just, yeah. that just sounds like Andy suggesting amazing. it. And like, think bananas, right? Bananas can elicit those uh, esters that maybe aren't there that you would maybe love to find. Pound cake is often something that is like this spongy cake, if you've never had it, that's kind of drenched in a rich essence of sweetness. Think lots of butter. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're using, I would say your amber ale is, is a little bit of the drizzle of the sauce over that banana pound cake. And there you go. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, because this beer has such a sweet prominence in this uh a caramel dominant flavor along with just this beautiful bready notes and these everything so we so we can really play with this and, and we know that sweet and sour goes well anyone who's ever had a margarita knows that sweet and sour play well together so take this beer and add something like you mentioned that that uh, tart barbecue sauce uh sweet and spicy goes together really well so i'm thinking spicy barbecue i'm thinking mexican or indian or or spicy thai um i think for me in this beer i i i go to sweet and savory i love that combination of sweet and savory especially if i'm grilling some like great sausage or some whatever whatever grilled meat especially if i'm doing it over a charcoal or a wood fire so i get some of these smoky uh, uh notes in there too that to me that just takes me to my 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 happy place uh with the, that flavor profile so play with it and and see what you come up with uh, this is just a really fun beer to pair with it, it offers so many opportunities but that being said that is the american amber slash american red ale and i i I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, pot, this style cast, excuse me. Uh, and it's a, it's a great beer. I hope you can find it and I hope you enjoy it. Yes, cheers to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the Prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.